Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. If you want to turn to 2 Corinthians 5.18, and we're going to get started on this Bible study called, How Are We Supposed to React, Respond, um, to the Lost World? How are we supposed to react, and how are we supposed to respond? Right. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the Ministry of Reconciliation. You see, I, I put the banner up here. I just bought this banner, and I know some people are going to be like, oh, you're just trying to copy somebody else, or copy somebody else. I needed something to block this window so I can do Bible studies any time of the day. I, I want something that is biblical, and this poster is going to play a part in this Bible study today. Okay. So, be, I'm just asking for some grace. Okay. Don't just be quick to attack and, and put people down. Okay. It's a good poster by Peter Ruckman. If any man be in Christ, old things are passed away. And I, can't, I know you can't see the bottom part, it says... All things, have be, all things have become new. Okay. But we're going to talk about the ministry of reconciliation. And I've had some brothers hit me up with, what am I supposed to do? And I see some brethren that are getting uh, weary and uh, agitated and frustrated with dealing with the lost world. And I wanted to do a little Bible study. Okay. Uh, I say a little, but this might be a two-part Bible study because I want to turn to all the scriptures with you. Right. So 2 Corinthians 5, 18. All things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Us being Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women, sons of God, uh, children of God. Um, I'm just going through. We're the ones that are, should be called Christians by the lost world. The word Christian has been... Um, been misused today because there's so many counterfeits today. But the point I'm pointing out is it says us. Okay, it doesn't say certain people, certain brethren, us. That includes all Bible believing, God fearing men and women. Okay, hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Okay? It's a ministry that everybody's a part of sisters in Christ, brothers in Christ, babes in Christ. Mature adults in Christ, you know, where it talks about novices versus experience, doesn't matter. Everybody is in the ministry of reconciliation, brothers and sisters of Christ. Everyone is. To wit that God was in Christ, the Godhead. God the Father, which is the soul, was in Christ, Jesus, which is the body. Body and soul are connected. Okay? Not to go off on too much of a tangent, but the body and soul are connected. Um, just like with us, our body and soul are connected when we're lost. What this body does, it taints the soul. And when the soul stands before Jesus Christ at the great white throne, its soul has to answer for all the sins that the body has committed because it's tainted by the sins of the body. Right. When you get saved, you've got that spiritual circumcision where our soul is no longer connected to this wicked body of flesh. We are now connected to the body, Jesus Christ. And He was perfect, and He paid for all of our sins. Okay, the ultimate cost of our sins, which is hell, He paid for it on the cross. The same thing works with the Godhead. Jesus, which is the body, is connected to God the Father, the soul. They are one. What he does, God the Father does. What God the Father does, he does. They share the same titles. That's why. But there's only one capital G God, the Father, the soul. It says, to wit, that God was in Christ. That's what makes Jesus God. Okay? God the Father was in Christ. We don't have God the Father in us. We have the Holy Spirit in us. But God said he will be with us. God the Father. Jesus said he will be with us. And then he talks about sending the Holy Spirit. What is that? That's the Godhead. Okay? Not the Trinity, the pagan Trinity. It's the Godhead. Okay? I can't explain how it works. How it works. I just know what it is and what the Bible says it is. But I don't want to go on too much to that. We're not talking about the Godhead today. We're talking about how to react to the lost world. And one of the ways we react to the lost world is reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation. Preaching the gospel. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. You read in the 
uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus is forgiving sins. When he's physically there, he's forgiving sins before the death on the cross. And they're getting on to him. Who does this man think he is? Acting like God, capital G God, and forgiving sins? Because only God can forgive sins. Well, Jesus is God, because he's got God in him. God the Father, the soul. And hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. We have the word of reconciliation today. It comes to you in the form of the King James Bible, God's perfect written word in English. Make sure you have a King James Bible. And if you haven't learned, if you don't know anything about, if you come across this video and you don't know anything about the Bible version issue, make a comment below in the comment section. And I will link the Bible version issue to you. That's what led me to Christ. I was a false convert for most of my life. The number one thing that led me to Christ is I had to get to a point where I was low, I was broken, and I said, you know what? I want absolute truth. I want the truth. I'm tired of being lied to in these Bible buildings. I'm tired of there being multiple Bible perversions. I'm tired of there being multi supposedly multiple ways to heaven. And I'm tired of all the way the world is. I'm tired of me and who I am, my flesh, my sinful wickedness. Okay. I had to come to a point where I was broken and God was able to say, Okay, you're really ready for truth? I just want the truth. I just I don't know where to get it. I want the truth. And then I got led to King James Video Ministries and the Bible version issue playlist. And that's what I always link to the brethren and to people that don't know about the Bible version issue. Okay? You need to get to the point where you want the truth. Because we are given, I'm giving you the words of reconciliation from God's perfect written word, the King James Bible. Do you want absolute truth? Yes or no? Are you at the point where you just, you don't care what the world says, you're tired of lies, you're tired of deceptions, and you want the truth? Okay, have committed unto us, there's the us again, the words of reconciliation. I think it's in Peter where it talks about how we are the priesthood of the believer. Now are we in charge of taking care of God's word and preserving it and keeping it out here for the world to hear God's word. Okay, we are committed to the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. Ambassadors. When you're an ambassador, all eyes are on you. We're going to get back to talking about this poster, but all eyes are on you. You're a new creature. The Bible says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You're supposed to be separate from the world. You're an ambassador now. I don't want to go off too much, but there's this drug going around among the body of Christ, this drug, and that drug is called culture. And you're being talked into going back to looking like the world and acting like the world and being part of the world. Uh, when I got saved, this is my new heritage. I'm not going to use the word culture because it's not a Bible word. Traditions of men? Psst. What, uh, rudiments of the world? Psst. Who cares? This is, my, is where my tradition is going to be found. This is where I'm rooted. This is my foundation. This is my life. This is my heritage. This King James Bible is the heritage of a Bible-believing, God-fearing man, woman, Christian. This is our heritage. When we get saved, God pulls us out of the culture of the world and says, Now be ye separate. You are now going to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. One of the videos I still promote, and I put it on my channel, is Peter Ruckman did a study uh, uh, preaching on things you can lose as a Christian. And the one thing you can't lose is your salvation. But one of the things you can lose is your testimony. You're supposed to be an ambassador for Christ, brothers and sisters of Christ, and the one thing you can lose is your testimony. So then when you go to try to witness to somebody, they're not going to listen to you. When you look at today, when you have ambassadors, ambassadors have to step down like from all these countries. When you catch them doing something that's really bad, very wicked, and notice I said the word catch, because that's how they live. They live as long as I don't get caught, it's, it's okay. No, sin is sin. But the point is, is when they do something bad, they lose their credibility. And they have to step down. 
We never step down, brother, says Christ, but you can lose your testimony with people around you, lost family members, lost neighbors, lost friends. You can lose your testimony to the point that no matter how much truth you try to witness to that person, you've already put up a wall between the two of you, and that person won't listen to you. Not to all Bible believers, you. Because you failed to be an ambassador for Christ with the life that you're living and the stands that you take. You keep looking like the world, acting like the world, and you keep holding on to that and you won't let it go. I know, brethren, that, uh, a little side note, I know, brethren, that they, they vehemently attack Catholicism, praise the Lord, but then in certain areas of their life, they're holding on to Catholicism and practices of the Catholic Church. That makes you a hypocrite. Now no Catholic's going to really listen to you. You've lost your testimony with the Catholics. Catholics aren't going to listen to you. You either get rid of it all and say, I want nothing to do with Catholicism, or you just continue being a closet Catholic. There is no in-between. Okay? We are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. So you ask, what are we supposed to do? How do we re respond to the lost world? Are you an ambassador for Jesus Christ? Are you part of the ministry of reconciliation? I've come across professing Christians that the more I look into it, the more I think they're, they're lost. That they'll sit there and say, I, I'm not called to preach the gospel. Okay, some people might be called to preach the gospel, that, but that's not for me. I don't, I don't preach the gospel. But I'm a Christian. No, you're not. We're all called into the ministry of reconciliation. If you're saved, you are called to preach the gospel. You're called to witness for Jesus Christ to the world by the life that you're living and by your words. Words and deed. Remember what it says? Whatever you do in word or in deed, do all to the glory of God, the Bible says. Yeah. So it's got to be both. And that makes you an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And you're a living witness for Jesus Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Is that your number one prayer, brothers and sisters in Christ, for the lost world? Your, the people that you have to work with, your co-workers, for those that are working, your neighbors, your family members? Right. I'm, I'm not going to go into it too much, but I just lost my daughter recently. And I feel bad because when I was lost, if I can talk about it for just a few minutes, when I was lost, a false Christian, all the things that I gave up for the Lord after I truly got saved, I promoted as a false Christian. So when I first got my daughter and started spending time with her, when I moved back from the military and everything, um, I was promoting wicked things. When I got saved... By that time that I got saved, she wasn't a young little girl. She was an older girl. She was around um, 10. And she couldn't understand, why am I getting up, giving up all these things? These things are fun. They're flesh fun. Video games, Hollywood movies, TV shows, okay, satanic style music, uh, holidays, certain holidays. I just started going through and doing research. I, I celebrated Thanksgiving. I celebrated Christmas when I first got saved. Okay, those are pretty much the only two things. And then on my birthday, um, I'd go out to lunch with my mom and my uncle. I mean, what little family I had left here in the air in, in Medford, which is, uh, that's where I used to live uh, before here. We'd go out a little bit. But over time, God, with the Holy Spirit, started convicting me and saying, you need to research these holidays. You need to research these holidays. And I had to start kicking some holidays out. But when I got saved, and I, the first thing I started doing when I got saved with my daughter was I started watching, we started reading the stories, Old Testament stories, and we read about Jesus, and we read about the Old Testament stories, and we'd, I'd have the computer, because I'd have this, I had this whole theater room set up when I was lost, and, and newly saved, that transition, so I had my computer hooked up to that big, big screen TV, and We'd look up images, we'd look up animals, we'd look up castles, we'd look up places. Not castles, but like forts when it talks about like with King David and everything. We would look things up so she'd get a visual image of you know, an idea of this is what the ark might have looked like. Here's some of the animals, okay? Here's, you know, the flaming sword that was, that was at the entrance to the Garden of Eden. You know, here's Elijah and uh, Elisha and... 
you know, this is what's going on here, that's what's going on here. We didn't do anything hardcore because she's a child, but we went through the stories and looked at the places and the animals and some of the practices. Okay. I started doing that, but by then it was like uh, I'd lost my testimony with her because she saw the transition of me going from lost to saved, and you think for an adult that would show a change. There's a change in this person's life. But Jesus said himself, that at, uh, the uh, prophet is without honor except in his own country. Among people who knew, in other words, he was given an example of people who knew you when you were lost. That's all they're going to see, for the most part. That's all they're going to see. They're not going to see the new creature in Christ Jesus. If any man be in Christ, the poster behind me, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things have become new. They're not going to see that. They're always going to see you as that old man for the most part. There's some that might be blessed that you're able to reach a family member regardless. But the point is, is I wanted, uh, now we, re now then, see, and Christ said, be reconciled to God. My hope for my daughter before she passed away was that she would give her life to Christ. And that needs to be our hope. Um, I remember one time that I upset her. I upset her, brothers and Christ, because I was typing and I was responding to messages and to emails. And I always liked using scripture. So I'm cutting and pasting from Sword Searcher, saying, okay, what about this verse? What about that verse? That would be great to help respond and encourage this brother in Christ, to encourage that brother in Christ. And then all of a sudden I got a bing from Facebook. Uh, my daughter was asking me a question because she was having a problem with something, uh, with how uh, she was having conflict with another person and how she should behave. And without thinking, I just grabbed a verse and I threw it to her. And I went back to doing my other things, just not thinking about it. And a few minutes later, she pinged me back, and she was angry. Don't, don't you dare link scriptures to me. I don't believe what you believe and everything. Her heart had become hardened. I mean, she got angry because of scripture. Instead of just saying, okay, that's nice, but uh, I just don't believe what you believe. No, she was anger, angry, hateful. Okay. When you're an ambassador for Jesus Christ, one of the things you're going to have to learn is, is you might have, without you even doing anything wrong, you might have lost your testimony with people around you that knew you when you were lost. But regardless of your lost testimony, regardless, your heartfelt desire is supposed to be, be ye reconciled to God. Verse 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh, so he could take on the sins of the world on the cross. For he, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. Two parts there. We might be. When you truly get saved and born again, brothers and Christ, you don't become sinlessly perfect overnight. And you don't become sinlessly perfect, period. It's a struggle for the rest of your life. But I'm saying your life doesn't get perfectly cleaned up just like that. God's going to work on you. Two years to get a lot of major things out of my life. Because there's some things that I was addicted to, some things I held on to, some things I fought the Lord on. It took two years to really get a lot of the major stuff out of my life. And then from there, it's always just struggling with it. And He'll show me little things here and there. Oh, you need to clean up this. You need to get that out of your life. You need to get this out of your life. Uh, you're not doing this when you're supposed to be doing this. And He starts showing me how to live a life of Christ separate from the world. You forsake the old man. Oh, no, 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 but we got culture. We, we're allowed to have culture and our, her our past heritage. No, you forsake that for your new heritage. Being a Christian, and, you're, and when you do that, you stick out from where you're from. If you're in Ger a German in Germany, you will stick out from the Germans because you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. If you're in France and you're French, you're going to stick out from them because you're not going to live the way they live anymore. You're going to be a new creature in Christ Jesus and you're going to start living the way God wants you to live. You're now an ambassador for Jesus Christ. But we might be made the righteous of God. The two parts I mentioned here. The second part, one is, is that Jesus is going to impute His righteousness to you as far as 
I now have liberty as a Christian because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. When I sin today, it's not going to cost me my salvation because it's not mine. It's God's. So I, I'm not going to lose the salvation that God has given me. I'm not going to get a one-way ticket straight to hell because I sinned. No, we have liberty as Christians today. Right? That's what liberty is. What Jesus did on the cross for us. Now, the second part of this is that you can look at it and say it's talking about the catching of the way of the body of Christ. We're only two-thirds redeemed. Like I said, your, your body, you don't get cleaned up overnight. We're going to talk about the changed life, but you don't get cleaned up overnight. It takes time. You st you're going to have to struggle with this body of flesh until the day you die or until God catches us up. I would say until God catches you up, period. And you're like, what do you mean? Until God catches you up in just soul, which is death, or God catches us up body, soul, and spirit, where we're changed and we get a new body that's incorruptible. Okay, until God catches us up, you're going to be struggling with this body of flesh. Right. So, we are called into the ministry of reconciliation. So what's the number one thing on how we're, number one way that we as brothers and sisters of Christ are supposed to respond to the lost world? Well, the number one way we respond to the lost world is we're to preach the gospel. We're supposed to be a living witness and preach the gospel. When doors open, we preach. There's times where door, door doesn't even have to open sometimes. If you feel called, this is a calling. If you feel called to do like a, a street witnessing ministry where you do a sign and you have gospel tracts to hand out and you're talking am amongst crowds, just preaching the word of God and preaching Jesus Christ and the gospel, yeah, just preach it. You know what I mean? Right now in these last days, uh, when it comes to work, when people are talking about it, their work or their neighbors or their family members, You've preached to them, and you pre wait for, sometimes, once you preached once to them, at that point on, you're waiting for an open door. You don't sit there and, and what they call nagging. You don't sit there and just yell at them, get saved, get saved, get saved, get saved. No, you tell them the gospel once, maybe twice. And at that point on, you're saying, Lord, open a door. They come to you and ask you, what were you saying about Jesus? What's, what's this thing that you're a part of? I don't, I, I don't know. I, I, I might, I don't know if I'm interested. I just... That's an open door. That's what we're praying for is open doors. So we're to preach the gospel. The first step, and like I said, even for me, the first step to salvation is 2 Corinthians 7, 8. To finding God's grace is through faith. The first step in faith is repentance. 2 Corinthians 7, 8. And notice what book this is in. This is Christ. Remember Corinthians. Paul doubts the salvation of the Corinthians because someone told him that now that they're saved, they can sin all they want and just live however they want. They can look like the world, act like the world, and laugh at the world's jokes. They can keep their culture and, and who cares about their new heritage, being a new creature in Christ Jesus. That's what's going on in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And Paul's doubting their salvation, so Paul has to re-preach repentance to them, hardcore. And this is the best example we got of how repentance leads to salvation. Not just at, sal not just at the moment of God saving you, but saving you your whole life. Anytime you fall apart, anytime you fail the Lord, brothers and sisters of Christ, you can repent and God can save you from that sin and put you back together and pick you back up and get you going again. That's the grace of God. That's the love of God. No matter how many times you fail Him as a saved sinner, He will pick you back up and put you back on the right path. Mm -hmm. But 2 Corinthians 7, 8. For though I made you sorry with the letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Okay, you know some people that you can get sorry and it's just for a season. Oh, I'm, I was sorry, but uh, now I'm not sorry anymore. Now I rejoice. See, we're not looking for the repentance that, that lasts for a season. We're looking for the repentance that lasts a lifetime, the rest of your life. That's what God's looking for. 
Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. You mean sorrow leads to repentance? It has a part to play in repentance? Oh yeah. And there's people that, that brothers is Christ, that's going to attack us and tell us, no it's not. Yes it is. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner. In other words, you were sorry towards God. Not to yourself, not to this person or that person there, to God himself. That ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow, sorrow towards God, godly sorrow, worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. Oh, I don't want to give up my culture. The Bible word is traditions of men. People like to use the word culture because it's, a, it's the lost world's way of trying to get away from the words of God. Be wary of people who always use the word culture all the time. Like I said, it's like a drug all of a sudden in the body of Christ. But the Bible word is traditions of men, rudiments of the world. That's the words the Bible uses, and it warns us not to be spoiled by philosophy and vain de deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world. Why? Because every time it'll make it so you don't go after Christ. It says, and not after Christ. When you don't give up the old man and the old wor the world, and come, we're in the world, but we're not of the world anymore when you get saved. Be ye separate, what the Bible says. But the sorrows of the world work at death. This is this first step, brother says Christ, is the ones that most the professing Christians I've ever met, the, this is the number one step that they miss. Every time. They have sorrows of the world. When I did that study, uh, uh, we have the right to have fun, be entertained, and such and such. We use three words. You could see a lot of false converts attacking me. God says that we will have peace in our life. If we're truly serving Him and living for Jesus Christ and getting all the wickedness out of ourselves, all the flesh fun, the flesh high, elevating the flesh, the Bible says we're to put the flesh down. Okay. But you have all these people that, they're, they're sorrow of the world. That's sorrow of the world. People who vehemently hold on to video games. There's nothing wrong with video games. People who vehemently hold on to holidays. Hollywood movies. Holidays, I say holidays, but holidays. Ways of the world. No matter how much you prove how wicked these things are, they don't care. Why? Because they have sorrows of the world. Be very careful. You can get saved. The new creature on this poster, I'm pointing out the new, on this side, new creature Christ Jesus. And then you can have a tendency to, the Bible talks about a falling away that we'll talk about in another study. Falling away, where you try to go back to the old man. You start going back to be having sorrows of the world. Uh, don't do that, brother, sister Christ. Stay the course. Stand, stand, stand. Don't faint, don't falter. But it says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance. That sorrow is for your sins. What did Jesus die for, for on the cross? The sins of the world. Your sins, my sins, put them on that cross. And what I said about uh, repentance that's not for a season, this is repentance that lasts a lifetime. Your attitude towards sin changes. You hate sin, you get angry at yourself when you sin, you don't want sin in your life. You realize you've sinned against an almighty, righteous God that's going to judge you one day and send you to hell and then to the lake of fire to burn for all eternity and you deserve it. And you've got this sorrow in your heart that, Lord, I'm so sorry. I don't want this sin. I hate this sin, Lord. I'm so sorry. There's nothing I can do to save myself. Oh, Lord, what must I do? Verse 11. For behold, the selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, evidence of salvation. You know there's people that are attacking the evidence of salvation that are, I believe, are Bible-believing, God-fearing men? They were past tense Bible-believing, but now they're falling away. And they're attacking the changed life. And they're saying, well, the changed life really isn't, isn't proof that you're truly saved and born again. Yes, it is. According to the scriptures, it is. Your attitude towards sin, that's part of the changed life. What's your attitude towards sin? I've always told that. When you back these false converts into a corner with absolute truth on their sin, their wicked ways, 
their false teachings? What's their attitude towards absolute truth? That's part of the that's the ultimate change in your life. You have a love of the truth and you hate sin. You love the Lord. Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. It's God's word. That's the changed life. And you have people attack it. Well, that doesn't really necessarily mean you're saved. Okay? So then how do we know if someone's saved or not? Who's the final authority? See, they're taking the final authority away from the Lord and making them the final authority on who's saved or not. Be very careful. Didn't mean to go off on a side tag like that, but be very careful, brothers and sisters Christ. The Bible lines up the changed life, the fruits meet for repentance. You shall know them by their fruits. Mm -hmm. Like I said, ultimately someone can start out where they look they seem to look good, they seem to look okay. But the more you push the word of God on them, how do they react? When you see things wrong in their life, how do they because there's gonna be wrong and something wrong in everybody's life. God's working on all of us. When someone comes to you and says, Hey, that hell day that you're doing. Let me show you the truth about that holiday. What's your attitude? Let me show you the truth about video games. From the scriptures, what talks about covetousness, which becomes idolatry. Video games are designed to be addicting. How do I know that? Because I was addicted to video games. I have my testimony up. You want another really quick testimony? I'll go back to my daughter. My daughter messaged me once because her PlayStation, the motor went out in her PlayStation 2, I think it was, and it wouldn't spin the discs. And she started she started going crazy. She started emailing all the family members on my side and her side trying to get money. She wants a new game system and everything. And she started telling me, you know, do I have any money over there? Did I leave any money over there? I'm like, all you've got is your thing of pennies. She has a chest that looks like a treasure chest that we put all these pennies that we saved and she, when she was younger, she used those pennies to do math. I was able to teach her math with the pennies. And um, using change, if you save up all your change, is a great way to teach your children math. When you have nickels and dimes and quarters, but we had pennies in there. All that was in there was pennies. And I remember telling her, hey, um, all I got here is your pennies. And you know what she said? She said, did you steal from me? You must have stole from me because I knew I had money over there. You must have stole from me. And I said, what, what are you talking about? She was so addicted and wanted that video game high, that video game high. Then she told me, well, mail me my pennies. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it's a perfect example right there that video games are designed to be addicting and they're a false god in the sense that the Bible says that covetousness is, which is idolatry. It becomes a false god that you covet. That's what video games are. And we go through and we show the scriptures where it says about covetousness, about idolatry, about addictions, bad addictions. You can have good addictions, but bad addictions that take you away from the Lord. But you have people that have sorrows of the world, sorrows of the world. When you truly repent and get saved and someone comes to you and says, hey, those video games are wicked, What's your attitude? Right here it says, For behold, this self same thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. Uh, okay, maybe with carefulness, maybe video games aren't good. Maybe holidays, I mean holidays, are not a good thing. I'm going to err on the side of caution. It's not in scripture. They pull people away. People have testimony after testimony after testimony on how wicked these things are and how God got them out of their life and now they're living for God with all their heart. I better get this out of my life. That's what carefulness it wrought in you. The evidence of salvation. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. I repented. I gave that to the Lord and I repented. Oh Lord, you just lifted a burden off my heart. Praise the Lord. What clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Like I said, when you truly come to the God broken before salvation, your attitude towards sin is, is I hate sin. You're angry at this flesh. And when you get saved, you've got to keep that anger towards this flesh as far as you need to keep this flesh in check. You need to keep it down, putting the flesh down. You need to keep your eye on your flesh and make sure it's not trying to deceive you and tempt you and get you back under the old man. 
You have your guard up now when it comes to your flesh. You know that with that that dwelleth in me dwelleth no good thing. Talk about your flesh. Okay. What fear? Lord, I don't want to fail you again. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. You fear God, you start studying the word of God, and God starts letting you know him a little bit every day. Starts letting you know him more. What vehement desire, your desire is to please God. Why were you created, brother and sister Christ? For thy pleasure we are and were created, the Bible says. It's talking about Jesus Christ created all things. Why were we created? To please God. What vehement desire, our desire is to please God. And how do you please God? By hiding God's word in your heart and living it. Looking for Jesus Christ to come back any day now by living the life of Christ. That's how you please God today. And you've got brethren turning their back on the imminent return. That The whole attitude of Jesus could come back any day now. I better get busy living for the Lord. They've turned their back on it. And their life shows it. What happened to that vehement desire? Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. And all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. The first step that we had to take, brothers and sisters of Christ, and if there's a false Christian following along, the first step you got to take is you got to come to a low point in your life where you say enough is enough. I'm no good. I, I'm just, I, I look at my life and, and I'm sinful. And I'm talking, I'm talking about the Bible says God's laws are written on every man's heart. So there's some things in your life you might not realize right away that it's sinful and wicked. But there's going to be a lot of things in your life as a false convert or just flat out lost that you're going to see and say, this is wickedness and I'm wicked, I'm filthy, I'm no good. I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low down, no good sinner on my way to hell and I deserve to go to hell for sinning against an almighty, righteous God. Lord, wherever you are out there, whoever you are, that show me the truth. I want the truth. I'm tired of the lies. I'm tired of this condition. Not point, I'm talking about my lost state, the old man. I'm pointing to the right side. The old man. This state. You're sick and tired of this state. If you never get there, you will never be saved by God. He will never save you. Because that's the only way that this next part goes from here to here. And I've preached this so many times. Before we get into it, it's belief. The next step in the finding salvation for the ministry of reconciliation is believing in the finished work, finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Not death, burial, and resurrection. Because when we're going to read here, uh, let's read it. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Notice it's in Corinthians again. <laughs> we're just going all over Corinthians. Why? Because they're the ones that were the, had the most false converts. And... and and Paul had to preach the gospel hardcore in great detail to him. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. And, uh, is it right? That's... I skipped too far. Sorry, this is Christ. I skipped too far. Here it is. And the reason I'm reading from my notes, I have things underlined to emphasize this, talk about this. 1 Corinthians 15.1 Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. Wait, wait. He's preaching the gospel to people that already have re supposedly received, and wherein you stand? He's preaching the gospel to professing Christians. Verse 2 Oh, it's also ye are saved if... So they're holding on. They've received death, burial, and resurrection. For which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory that what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. How do they believe in vain, brothers and Christ? We talked about this. The Jewish people, it said the Jewish people believed and were zealous of the law. They believed in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but they didn't believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. They believed you had to be circumcised and keep the laws of Moses also in order to be saved. In other words, when Jesus said it was finished, evidently it wasn't finished. 
to them. And you have same people like that today. A lot of false religions out there that claim that they believe in the death, and they do, they believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Head knowledge. But they've, never, they've skipped the first step, and it's never made it down here because they don't believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And I've come across false brethren that claim that they do, oh, I do, oh, I do, and, I, and they skip repentance. I believe in the finished work. Then why do you keep sinning left and right as far as enjoying sin, justifying sin, living however you want, looking like the world, acting like the world, laughing at the world's jokes? Why do you keep living like that? Because they, in their heart, they don't believe it is finished. They've never repented. It's just a head belief. That's all it is. But what is this belief that we're supposed to have? For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. You say it doesn't say it is finished. That Christ died for our sins. Not that Jesus Christ died, death, burial, and resurrection. He died for our sins. According to the scriptures. You compare scripture to scripture. Jesus is on the cross. He says, it is finished. There's now no more sacrifice for sins. You don't go through the Old Testament Levitical laws and circumcision to be saved. You go through Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. His death, burial, and resurrection, but the finished work. He died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The raising from the dead, third day, is him proving that he is God fully and completely. Not a third of God, not lowercase g, God the Son. He is God the Father, fully and completely. Okay. And we talk about this, okay. What did they do to Jesus Christ? They whipped him. By thy stripes we are healed. Okay. They whipped him. The Bible talks about in the Old Testament how they ripped his beard out. The prophecy in the Old Testament that applies to, well, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John are primarily Old Testament. Uh, they ripped out his beard. They beat him. They spit on him. They smacked him around. They whipped him to where he was bleeding. They nailed him to a cross. And he bled out. He died above blood loss. He bled out. And you know what? He didn't sit there. He didn't complain about it. He asked God, said, if it be possible, take this cup from me. And the reason he did that for us, brothers and sisters of Christ, remember, things that are written before time, because that's Old Testament, is written for our learning before the New Testament doesn't come in until Jesus' death, when he actually dies. So the moments before he died is still Old Testament. He did that for our learning to understand, so we could understand that was the only way. Jesus, that was the only way that we could be saved. And Jesus, who is God, manifests in the flesh, the likeness of sinful flesh, chose that sacrifice for you and me, brother and sister of Christ. What he went through, and I remember te people got on to me when I, in my studies about, is there such thing as a carnal Christian? Does the Bible teach that you can be carnally minded and walking after the flesh and be saved? And the answer, I'll give the answer, but you go watch the studies, the answer is no. When you get saved, you become spiritually minded, walking after the Spirit. But in that study, we talked about it, and it was like, these easy believers and people think that it's not finished. i got to whip them again. i got to whip them again. i got to smack them a few more times. i got to spit on them a few more times. Remember what it says we get angry up here when it comes to repentance? And our walk with the Lord after, starts at salvation, and it continues our whole life. You're supposed to get angry at yourself when you sin, when you let the Lord down. You're supposed to get angry at yourself. You're, it's like you're spitting on them. Oh, I gotta whip them again. I gotta whip them again. Okay. The second step, the belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. He was wounded. For our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquities. I'm trying to remember. He was wounded for our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. With his stripes we are healed. That belief will never make it down here 
It'll only be head belief, and that belief will be in vain if you skip repentance. It's only through repentance that it's a heartfelt conviction and that heartfelt belief that what Jesus did for me on the cross, He died for my sins. Lord, take my life. It is Yours. Change my life. Help me, O oh Lord. Help me. What do I do to please You? It's not about pleasing my flesh anymore, Lord. It's about pleasing You. That heartfelt change. You know how often we go through the Bible and it comes to a heart? It always comes back to the heart. It always comes back to the heart. It always comes back to the heart. It's a heart issue. It's not a head issue. It's a heart issue. Okay? That's the second step. We're the ministers of reconciliation. We're supposed to be preaching this. Okay? And we're looking for people that are, are repentant. That's the open doors. When you see someone that seems like they're broken, they seem like they, they, they realize there's something wrong with their condition, there's something wrong with this world, they're starting to head into repentance. It's an open door. The third step in faith, to find God's grace. Notice it said uh, repentance comes before salvation. It says repentance to salvation. The easy believism people, they can't stand this. We keep showing to them. They don't have a, that's, that's a test of the changed life. Do you have a love of the truth? Well, no, 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 we don't have the love of the truth. Why don't you have a love of the truth? That's the sign of someone who's saved. It says repentance to salvation. And some of them will go, well, repentance is just going from unbelief to belief. No, it isn't. That's a lie. But what's that, what's that all about? So they can keep their sin. They can keep living however they want to live, and they don't. And they just their belief in the finish. Uh, they don't believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ, but they believe in the death, burial, and resurrection. And that belief is just head belief. Like I said, the Jews were a big example. You can go to Simon the sorcerer; he's a great example too. He believed, didn't receive the Holy Ghost, and then tried to bribe him for the Holy Ghost. He wasn't saved, but he believed. But the best example I've found in the Bible to uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1, as you go through and you learn about the, the, uh, the Jews trying to bring the Gentiles back under the law. These Jews that believe and are zealous of the law. And if they believe that you have to keep the laws of Moses and circumcision in order to be saved, they themselves are not saved. They don't believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It is finished. The greatest example. The third step, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. Prayer. You start your talk with the Lord. You cry out to the Lord. Romans 10, 8. And they'll say, this is the Romans road to hell. The Romans road to hell. Said by people that are on their way to hell. Okay. Anybody who's a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman that's truly saved, understand that Romans is written to Christians. Acts is a transition book. And then we get into Romans. Who, Romans are Gentiles. But this is written to the church at Rome that has Jews and Gentiles. All these uh, Pauline epistles, one of the biggest mistakes I made in my walk with the Lord was I used to say it's to the Gentiles at Colossians. It's to the Gentiles at the Philippians. That's not true. It's to the church saved sinners in those areas. Romans is written to the saved sinners at Rome. In the New Testament. And you'll have people that'll say, Oh no, it's the Romans road. It's the Romans road to hell. Romans 10.8. It's not. Romans are written to us, brothers and sisters of Christ. Don't listen to them. Keep preaching this. You confess both in prayer and you ask God to save you. Romans 10.8. Remember the Bible says that we, brothers and sisters Christ, we confess our faults one to another. Our faults. But you're supposed to confess your sins to the Lord. There's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. You go to Christ Jesus and you confess your sins and you throw your sins at the foot of the cross, true repentance. Repent, forsake, and get back to your walk with the Lord. But what you're repenting is your state that you're in. You're not cleaning up your life right now when you before salvation. It's you're repenting on your sinful, wicked state that you're in. And you tell the Lord about that. Okay, Romans 10, 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. Heart issue. 
not a head issue, heart issue. That is the word of faith. The Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. It starts at salvation. Which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. This is one of those key verses that we use for the Godhead because Jesus said he will raise himself from the dead. Then the Bible says the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. And this says God, the Father, there's only one capital G, God, the Father, raised him from the dead. The person of the Godhead raised Jesus from the dead. But we're supposed to confess with our mouth what's in our heart. And there's people that can lie, brothers and sisters of Christ, I'm telling you. There's people that can lie. Good words and fair speeches, they can lie. But if you keep at them, eventually their true heart is going to show through their words. I've had people that got called out hardcore for being false converts, wolves in sheep's clothing. Because bottom line, eventually when you start hitting them up with the Word of God and the life they're living and what they're doing is wrong, their words change. And you're starting to see what's really in their heart. It always comes to the heart. Out of the buns of the heart, the mouth speaks. Eventually the truth of who they really are is going to come out. And I pray that who they really are is save sinners. That's, what I, that's my heart's desire. My heart's desire isn't, I just want to see everybody that's false converts. I wish everybody was truly saved. So does Paul. <laughs> but that's a whole other study. Paul wishes that all the people that profess to be saved were truly saved. But he's sick and tired of false converts. Now, how many of us are? I'll raise my hand. Thou shalt be saved. Thou shalt be saved. Future tense. You have to confess your repentance, your sin, God, a sinful, wicked state, and that it was what Jesus did on the cross that saved you from that wicked state, that Jesus is God fully and completely. Well, yeah, it's part of the steps to salvation. Verse 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. With your heart, God looks at the heart, and he says, Okay, your heart's right. I'm going to impute my righteousness to you. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Once again, unto. To or unto means it leads to it. It comes before God saves you. Confessing both your repentance and your belief come before God saves you. Verse 11, For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not you were saved before and then you called on the name of the Lord. No, you call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Afterwards, it comes before salvation. Prayer, that's the first time you start praying and you continue praying without ceasing, the Bible says. You're to pray without ceasing. Your prayer life starts at salvation before salvation. You throw your uh, sins at the, of the at the feet of the cross. You don't hold on to them. They're not in your heart anymore. I didn't say you cleaned up your life. I said they're not. you're not holding on to them like, I have to keep these sins. These are my sins. I love my sins. You hate them and you throw them at the foot of the cross. King David said in the Psalms that if I hold sin in my heart, or iniquity, I'm sorry. If I hold iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. Another re like I said, repentance is the number one reason why people don't get saved. But I prayed a prayer, God didn't hear you. Why? Because you're holding sin and iniquity in your heart. You're holding on to those sins. You're not sorry for those sins. You just want a free pass to heaven. Uh, or you want to be part of this group that's a Christian group. Or it's just, it's something that's it's good to be called a Christian because you get treated better like when America was predominantly Christian, people would call themselves Christian because it was popular. It was the right thing to do. And it is, but I'm talking about by the world standards. But they weren't doing it by God's standards. They weren't doing it for the Lord. They were doing it for themselves or for the people around them. God looks at the heart. And you say, well, how can someone who's mute, can't speak, how can they pray? Uh, well, you go back in the Old Testament to um, Samuel. His mother, I can't remember the mother's name, but if you go back to Samuel. Give me a second. Well, here it is. And Hannah, chapter 2, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord, my horn is exalted. 
I rejoice in thy salvation. There's none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee. No, this isn't it. This is something else. Sorry. But uh, you look in here, and the story about Hannah, because this wasn't in my notes, she couldn't have a child. So she goes to pray, and she's praying with all her heart. The words are coming from her heart. Her lips are moving, but there's no voice coming out. Just her lips are moving, and she's praying. She's speaking from the heart, but there's no voice coming out. And it's not Elijah, um, Eli. And Eli sees it and thinks she's drunk. Brother Jesus Christ, Eli sees it and thinks she's drunk. But I'm not drunk and I just have a sorrow of the heart. I so desire to have a child. It's a sorrow of the heart that I am this way. She doesn't speak out loud, but she's praying. See, that's just a cop-out, Brother Jesus Christ, that the lost world will use to get you to turn your back on prayer as part of salvation. Prayer comes from the heart. How many times have you bowed your head and you get really fervent in prayer where you're not actually speaking, you're just, your lips might be moving, and you're just talking in your heart, and you're talking to the Lord without your voices coming out? How many times have you done it, Brother Jesus Christ? I pray you've done it sometimes, but there's times I've done it. I like to pray out loud. I like to talk and pray to the Lord a lot. But there's times where you do ver uh, what's it called fervent prayer, and uh, you're just your lips are moving, but all the words are coming out of your heart. Don't fall for that trap and that lie that that it's not true because then there would be certain people that they can't get saved because they're not allowed to speak. They're mute. They can't speak. They can still speak from their heart. Everybody. Every man, woman on this earth that's in a position where they can be saved and they're above the age of accountability that can be saved can pray. Everyone can. Regardless of your physical condition, everyone can. There's evidence of it in, in the Bible. Okay. Those are the steps. Sometimes people make confess both the prayer step and then ask God to save you a step. I just went ahead and put them both together again, but sometimes you can say there's four steps, sometimes you can say there's three steps, but this is the way of faith. This is going through faith. You have to have faith that there is a God out there that you've sinned against, a God that you can't see. You have sorrow towards a God you cannot see. That takes faith, brother says Christ. When it says that you are saved by God's grace, by grace through faith, What's the through faith? Those steps that we just talked about. Repentance. Belief in the finished work. Finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Repentance. Having sorrow in your heart for your personal sins that you've sinned against God. That put Him on the cross. And always, see that repentance always leads to the cross. True biblical repentance. Not going from unbelief to belief, but having sorrow in your heart for your personal sins that put Jesus on the cross. And that leads to the to belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Finished work. You confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. That's the through faith. And Satan doesn't want you going through faith. So he has all these easy, believies, easy believism um, heretics, wolves in sheep's clothing, ministers of Satan come along and tell you that the, only, the, the faith is just the head belief and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's all it is. That's all the faith is. Just head belief in the death, burial, and resurrection. And they'll switch that around and say that being grace, you're not saved by God's grace. You're saved by your faith. It's faith alone, faith alone, faith alone. And yet when you ask them, because you become a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman, you say, where does it say faith alone? The one passage in Hebrews, it says faith is without works is being dead alone. Faith without works is being dead alone for instruction. That's for the time of Jacob's trouble because your faith means nothing if you take the mark of the beast. You can have all the faith in the world. You take the mark of the beast, you go to hell. Your, de your destiny is going to hell and there's no turning it around at that point in the time of Jacob's trouble. Not today in the church, what we call the church age, from the death of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? But for instruction righteousness, faith, evidence of faith, if you truly have faith, you went through repentance. The belief 
But confessing both in prayer, if you truly had faith, it's going to lead to good works. There's instruction in righteousness in that passage. Why? Because the Bible teaches that after you get saved, after God saves you, He gets rid of your old life, the old man, and the old man, and He gives you a new life. Over here. 2 Corinthians 5. Second Corinthians five. Verse fourteen. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we are all dead. The old man is a walking corpse, it's like a zombie. He's on his way to hell. And he deserves to go to hell. That's the old man. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. See, this easy believism pushes that you can live unto yourself. You don't have to live for the Jesus Christ. You don't have to love Jesus according to the scriptures, which is keeping his word. You don't have to have a changed life. You can live unto yourself. You can have your culture, your heritage, the old man. I'm oh, sorry, over here. The old man. You can have the old man and be a Christian too. You don't have to have a changed life. When we get saved, we no longer live unto ourselves. It's not about what I want. There's times where we can make requests. The Bible says we can make our requests known unto God and say, Lord, I'd love to have a wood stove. My two biggest prayers for this home lately, for this year, is to be able to save up for a wood stove and a couple solar panels, or enough, let's see if I can do a solar panel set up to, get the, to run the, um, the freezer for all the fish that I fish for and the meat for hunting. And that way, if anything bad happens, you know, we lose power here sometimes, but what if we lose power indefinitely? We always talk about the way the world's heading. Um, those two things are our biggest prayer, but they're not a need. If they were a need, God would have provided them. It's a want. God's kept me warm. He's kept the electricity going. He's, he's provided. It's a want. It's not a need. Okay? You can make certain requests that aren't needs. Absolutely. But what this saying is, is your heartfelt desire is going to be what God wants. He'll tell you through the scriptures what God wants. Living for Jesus Christ. Not living for your culture. Not living for the traditions of men. Not living for the rudiments of the world. Not living by the flesh. In Romans 8, it talks about how we are now spiritually, capital S, spiritually minded, walking after the Spirit. We don't live under ourselves. We live under God, saying, and the Holy Spirit in us tells us what pleases God and what doesn't please God. Coachiousness, which is idolatry, doesn't please God. Inviting idols into your home through holidays, holidays, doesn't please God. It upsets God. Okay? You're living to yourself. But one of the things about being a changed life is we don't live under ourselves anymore, brothers and Christ. Now, you can be saved and be celebrating holidays. I just told you, when I got saved, I was celebrating holidays. I was still playing video games, Hollywood, watching Hollywood movies and TV shows. All right? But there was a change. I'll talk about it in just a second. But unto him which died for them and rose again. That's who we live for, Jesus Christ. That's what we're that, looking for that blessed hope in this present world, the Bible says, looking for that blessed hope. It's an action. It's the life that you're living. You're living your life to please God now. The old man was all about the flesh, pleasing the flesh and doing things the ways of the world, and the world's way. The new man, it's about pleasing God and doing things God's way. I don't know why that we, there's brethren that are fallen, they're in a fallen state, and they've gone back to doing things the world's way and pleasing the war and pleasing their flesh. It's more important than, than doing things God's way and pleasing God. That's who we're supposed to please. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. 
Why? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, it's a Bible if. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I told you I'd talk about this. In my testimony, I talk about this. When I got saved for two years, I was still, I didn't, for the first six months, I wasn't struggling with sin. I was just, God got some things out of my life that were obvious sins, but I had such a love of the truth, I was going crazy. With the, word, with the Word of God. Um, the Bible version issue videos. I watched King James Video Ministries when Brother Brian was in a standing position and not falling flat on his face, but in a standing position, not drunk with culture, drunk high on culture. He taught me the Bible version issue. I went through all his Bible version issues so many times I lost count when I was newly saved. I had such a love of the truth. I started going through all his major doctrine videos so many times I lost count. That first six months I was going crazy wanting to know the truth, saying, Lord, show me the truth, the major doctrines. I was angry at the people that lied to me in the Babel buildings, how they didn't teach me the truth. I knew nothing. I was a professing Christian going to these Babel buildings. I knew nothing about my Lord and Savior, the real Jesus Christ. They lied to me. And I went through all those studies hardcore, but then God picked me up and said, okay, I've shown you so much truth. Let's take a look at your life. Let's do, like, you ever heard that thing like house cleaning? It's house cleaning time. We need to clean house. Let's look at your life and see what you're doing. I had, I told this in my testimony, I had over 300 uh, DVD movies. I had um, an Xbox that was modified with a hard drive in it that had almost every Xbox game on it. I had uh, my computer hooked up and was playing all kinds of video games on there, online games. Uh, MMORPG, if I said it right. Games. All right. I was doing all this stuff. And God said, okay, let's sit down. I'm serious. I actually sat down. I had those cabinets. I don't know if you remember what those cabinets looked like, but the old wood cabinets that when you open them up, you put the VHS movies. That's what these cabinets were. They were old. And I had updated from oh, having over 300 VHS movies and I got rid of the VHS and swamped them out for DVDs and got all my movies replaced with DVDs. A lot of money. But here's the thing. I sat there and we started... I would watched those movies so many times I didn't even have to put it in and watch it again to see if there were some bad things. I could pull it up and I'd hold the DVD. I was just sitting there on the ground in front of those cabinets. I pulled this, the DVD out and held it in front of me and said, started going through it in my head. I could go through the whole movie in my head because I'd watched these movies. I praise the Lord. He's had me. This is now my love. This flesh isn't my love. My love is towards the Lord and pleasing Him. And this is what I'm going through a million times, the Word of God. But I've gone, as a lost man, I've gone through those movies so many times. I held the movie in my head. Okay? This one has cussing in it. This one has sodomite jokes and promotes sodomy. This one, there's nudity. This one, it promotes uh, feminism hardcore. And the Bible says feminism is the sin of witchcraft. Feminism is a sin. It's wickedness. There's no part of feminism that's okay in God's eyes. It's wickedness. Okay, this. Okay, there's a drinking game in this. Okay, that's gone. There's fornication in this. They're promoting fornication. Sex outside of marriage. And so on. I can pick the movies up and, okay, we got to throw it. And I had to start throwing the movies away. And the movies started getting smaller and smaller and smaller. What is this? A changed life. My heart is to the Lord. And the Lord said, okay, it's time to clean house. Let's see what your life is like. Let's see how your house is. And it wasn't just that. The movies, the video games had to start going. you got to get rid of those video games. I got rid of them. Uh, I still did, like I said, I, I, I celebrated holidays for a while, and then I moved out here and stopped celebrating, not because I believed they were a sin, I just didn't really celebrate them. But in the last couple of years, I've had, God's really put it on my heart to start looking into holidays. I call them holidays because that's exactly what they are. Okay, the lost world loves these pagan worldly holidays. Holidays is what they call them. And it's traditions of men. It's rudiments of the world. And we're called out from that. Be separate from the world. And if you do research on all these holidays, you'll find that there's Satan behind every one of them. Man-made holidays. Satan's behind every one of them. And it's all about lifting yourself up 
You can be as God's knowing good and evil. It's about puffing yourself up and glorifying yourself and elevating your flesh. In other words, you're treating yourself like God. Or you're, without knowing, even ignorantly, like with Christmas, some of the brethren were ignorant with Christmas. I'm not, I'm worshiping Jesus, and I'm remembering his birth, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's a good thing, that's a great thing. But you're doing it ignorantly on December 25th, when you're doing it promoting a pagan holiday. And we show you the truth of the pagan holiday. There's a changed life. I'm still changing to this day. God is still cleaning stuff up out of my life to this day. That's the evidence of salvation. When someone comes to me and says, hey, what you're doing there is wickedness, let me show you according to the scriptures, because we're supposed to be like the Bereans. Check the scriptures to see if those things are so. Someone comes to you and says Christmas is, is idolatry, and covetousness, which is idolatry, it's idol worship. You go, Here's, what does the Bible say about idols? False idols. Get them out of your life. What's your attitude? Those video games. They're covetousness. They're designed to be addicting. I told you about my daughter. They're designed to be addicting. They're going to try to take you away from the Lord. When you get saved, this is where you're supposed to be spending your time. In God's Word, in prayer, in fellowship. There's some of us that have to, well, and work. Physical work that you're doing with your hands around the house to keep the house going. Video games don't keep the house going. They, they keep you from doing the work that needs to get done around the house. All right? But so on and so forth. The changed life, brothers and sisters Christ, comes after salvation, and it's evidence of salvation. Good fruits that are based off Scripture. Well, I do this for the Lord, chapter and verse. God showed me through His Word the do's and the don'ts. This is how you live your life. This is how you're not supposed to live your life. This is what you do to please me. This is what doesn't please me. It's all based in His Word. And you've got brethren that are vehemently defending things that aren't in Scripture. But I'm doing this for the Lord. No, you're doing it for yourself. You're falling back into the trap of the old man. You're falling back into the traditions of men, rudiments of the world. You're starting to fall back into pleasing. The Bible talks about lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. When you first got saved, you loved God so much. Just with a passion. Loving His Word, like I said, with a passion. For six months, I was just going through every video multiple times. And I got all caught up in the, uh, with King James Video Ministries when Brian was in a standing position. And the, I call it the old King James. At this point, I'm calling it the old King James Video Ministries. The old King James Video Ministries... I went through all those videos, left and right. I started reading the Bible every morning, every night. Chapter every morning, chapter every night. I started praying a lot. I started talking to the Lord about His Word. Open the Scriptures to me, Lord. Give me wisdom. There's a change. Where you spend most of your time, that's where your God is. Someone said that to me once, and it's like, yeah, that's true. If you're spending eight to nine hours a day playing video games, and oh, there's nothing wrong with video games, that's where your God is. It's not Jesus Christ. It's that video game. Oh, there's nothing wrong with, you know, heritage and everything. And you're spending all your time in heritage. That's your God. It's not Jesus Christ. Culture. Culture. Like I said, lately it just seems like that's the new thing to fight today. Is we're supposed to be, we need to fight against culture. It's become a drug to some of the brethren. They're, they're high on culture, and, and with, like most drug addicts, they don't care who they hurt or who they kill to keep their drug. Culture, culture. Yeah. Romans 6 1. The easy believism says, oh, no, no, there doesn't have to be a changed life. There doesn't have to be a changed life. Romans 6 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Remember, we're saved by, we're saved by grace through faith. It's, it's by grace alone, by faith alone. You can't have both those things and say that they're alone when you have two things. It's either grace that you're saved or it's faith that you're saved. It's not, it's not you can't say both. Uh, it's, it's grace alone through faith alone. Brain dead people. But the point is, is, they want to keep the flesh. They want to continue living in sin. They want to keep the way the old man. 
They don't want the old man to be dead and buried with Christ. And this is Paul saying, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You know what it means by being dead to sin? It means that sin no longer has dominion over us, brothers and sisters in Christ. When you were lost without God in the world and without hope in the world, as the Bible says, you had no authority. Your, your body was running you. Now that you're saved, God has put down the flesh by His death on the cross. He's overcome sin and death. You, sin has no more dominion over you. When you sin, it's because you chose to sin and it's 100% your fault. It was your fault in the Old Testament, I mean, before, the old man, but understand what I'm saying. When you sin as a Christian, a Bible-believing Christian, it's 100% your fault. Yes, you got tempted by this flesh. Yes, we're supposed to be putting this flesh down. But this flesh does not have dominion anymore. Unless you let it. The Old Testament, I mean, also, the old man, the old man, you, there's a lot of lost people that try to give up bad things, try to be morally right and give up bad things, but their flesh is still in charge. They're still being led by the flesh. They give up one bad addiction and replace it with another bad addiction. And, you, and they just hold up the one bad addiction that they gave up, but what they did was they turned around and found another, their flesh got them to find another addiction to deceive them, and they're doing another bad addiction, so they just gave up one bad addiction for another bad addiction. The flesh is in charge when you're lost. When you're saved, God gives you the authority and power to put down the flesh. When, you're de when it says dead to sin, it doesn't mean that you're sinless. It means that sin doesn't have dominion. Your flesh doesn't have dominion anymore. It's not in charge. The Holy Spirit is in you. The Holy Spirit's in charge, and He empowers the soul. He empowers the spirit. You're now spiritually alive. You're not that dead zombie corpse walking around over here. Know ye not that so many of us that were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? The whole point of baptism, for an outward showing, remember the important part is spiritual baptism. That's what saves. Water baptism does not save. Physical water baptism does not save. It's an outward showing to remind you that the old man is dead and buried when you go under. That old life is gone. The new man is raised. The new creature in Christ Jesus. Your, whole, your, your soul is now connected to Jesus Christ. That's why you're called the body of Christ. We are baptized into his death. The old man is dead and buried. Therefore we are buried with him in baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, another verse about God the Father raising Jesus from the dead, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, the old man goes down, dead and buried, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, the new man. And this is talking about spirit and soul. Remember, the, the body has not been, we haven't gotten our new body yet. We're two-thirds redeemed. God understands the struggle with sin that we're going to have for the rest of our life, but remember, brothers of Christ, it no longer, our flesh no longer has dominion. You have to give it dominion. You have to give in to the temptations of the flesh. And when you fell the Lord, you go before you, you go before the cross, and you throw that iniquity at the foot of the cross. You repent. You forsake. You put the flesh back down, and you get back to serving the Lord. You get back to following the Lord. Amen. That's the life of a Christian. These easy believism counterfeits, these frauds, they just live in wicked with sin and sin and sin and sin and sin, and they don't care. They love their sin. They justify their sin. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. You're no longer the servant of sin. When you get saved, you're the servant of Jesus Christ. You, we talked about it. We, for thy pleasure they are and were created. Talking about us. Jesus created us to please Him, who is God fully and completely. We don't serve sin anymore. We're not trying to please the world. We're not trying to please our flesh anymore. Our heart's desire now is to serve Jesus Christ through His perfect written word. And one, the number one thing that pleases God 
is when we hide His Word in our heart that we might not sin against Him, getting sin out of our life. The more sin you get out of your life, the closer you get to the Lord. That pleases God. That pleases God. He wants to be close to you, brothers and sisters of Christ. But the sin that you hold on to, or if you start falling back into the old man, uh, that displeases God. Because then that puts a wall between you and you go back to being further apart. He wants to be close to you. you got to get sin out of your life. Verse 7, For he that is dead is free from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Looking for that blessed hope. Jesus is in, says, In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it was not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Okay, We shall also live with him. We're supposed to start living for Jesus Christ today. That's what looking for that blessed hope is all about. In this present world, looking for that blessed hope. Every Christian, starting at Paul, is to live a life that Jesus could come back any day now with the life that they're living. They're living for Jesus Christ because they could get called home at any moment. They're to live for Jesus Christ every day. Verse 9. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he lived, he lived unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Your flesh is not supposed to be in charge as a saved sinner. God is. The Holy Spirit is. Verse 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as the, those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law. The Levitical laws, brother says Christ, are a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. They're to remind us that this flesh is sinful, it's wicked, there's no way that we can ever be sinless, there's no way we can earn heaven. But we're not under that law anymore. What are we under? We're under grace. We're under Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? See, we're not under the law, therefore I can sin all I want. Easy believism. Live however you want. Sin however. It's just sin, sin, sin. God forbid. Know ye not that as to whom ye shield ye I'm sorry. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. Whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart. Not the head, the heart. That form of doctrine, that form of doctrine, which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Once again, we serve a risen Savior. We serve Jesus Christ. We do what pleases Him. We put this flesh down because that pleases Him. And we live for Jesus Christ. Be not conformed to this world. Love not the world. Don't be spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit. It's after the traditions of men and rudiments of the world. That doesn't please God. Why? Because that puts a, a wall between you and Christ because you're no longer going after Christ. If you start conforming to the world, you're not going after Christ. If you start loving the world, you're not going after Christ. It puts a wall between you and starts separating you. Now, I'm not saying separating us as far as salvation. I'm talking about you're, put, you're allowing something to come between you and your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Right. We're not supposed to be living that way. There's supposed to be a changed life. And there's a lot, like I said, the, the changed life, the love of the truth, what's their attitude towards the love of the truth? And, and applying that love of the truth to the life that they're living. That's how you can tell the, the false converts from the truly saved. That's always been the way. 
I, when someone's questionable, I just start hitting them up with the Bible. With, the Bible says this. The Bible says that. See that thing you're doing there? The Bible says it's, it's wrong. Not, I'm not talking about to a newly saved. Like I said, when I was newly saved, my testimony, I was a mess. I was a complete wreck for up to two years. I still struggle with sin. There's God still pointing sin out in my life to this very day. But I'm talking about the major, when you have to do the major clean that we talk about. Like when you do a house, every year you do a major clean. And then you can do minor cleans the rest of the year. Weekly cleans the rest of the year. But every year, once a year, you move all the furniture. You wipe everything down. You do a major clean of the whole house once a year. Some people do it twice a year. But the point is, is that major clean, it took a while for God to get that out of my life. But I'm talking about, you see someone who's a veteran Christian, I've been saved 20 years, and you're like, uh, but that thing you're doing there, that's wickedness and sin. You mean God never showed you in 20 years that video games are wrong? Holidays are wrong? God never showed you that drinking and getting drunk is wrong in 20 years? Foul language is wrong in 20 years? And so on and so forth, etc., etc., etc. God never showed you that? I said, holidays, I've been saved for eight years now. And two years ago, four years into being saved, God showed me that, not four, six years into being saved. It took six years to show me that these holidays, there's just something not right about them. What happened to chapter and verse? Holidays, I call them holidays. Holidays. Because that's what they are. They're just, they're about distracting the lost world so that we can't preach truth to them. And they disguise some of these holidays as Christian days when they're not to distract the lost world to prevent us, trying to prevent us from being able to witness to them. That's why you have all these false religions claiming to be Christianity, to prevent us from witnessing to them. Okay. Ephesians 2.4 there's supposed to be a changed life. You're no longer the servant of sin. You're no longer carnally minded, walking after the flesh. Because that's what you were before you got saved. Carnally minded, walking after the flesh. Now you're supposed to be, if you're truly saved, you're capitalized, spiritually minded, walking after the Spirit. You're going to fail the Lord sometimes. You're going to fall flat on your face sometimes. But God will pick you back up and get you going again. The other side of someone who's truly saved and born again is there's chastening in their life. Okay, the Bible says, if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. There's consequences to sin. That's not called chastening. Some people try to act like that's just chastening from the Lord. No, that's consequences for sin because God said that's the way sin works. If you live after the flesh, ye shall die. Okay, that's just the way that the consequence. When it comes to chastisement, it's a whole other study that we... I, I can't remember if I did a full study on it or if it was within a study, but we talked about chastisement from the Lord. It's going to be something that does, that you you could you, there's all, you have to say it's from the Lord. A tree falls on your house and, and, and destroys your roof. That's the Lord. You get drunk and then all of a sudden you get cancer of some kind. Your liver starts going bad. You get drunk a lot. That's the cost of sin. That's the wages of sin. That's not chastisement of the Lord. That's the wages of sin is death. There's still a cost to sin physically, the Bible talks about. Okay? But there is chastisement from the Lord, and He does that because He loves us, and He'll get us back on the right track. Okay? There's a changed life. And people think that, like in First and Second Corinthians, there was a lot of people thinking, what, I can have eternal life? I can go to heaven and live in paradise forever if I just believe? Not in the finished work, but just have the head belief and say a little prayer, and I'm good. Or not even say a prayer at all, just head belief. And I get to go to heaven, and I can still live however I want to live? That's the appeal for this easy believism, which is, is uh, Satanism. That's the appeal to it. You can live however you want, and continue doing it, living it up here, so you can live it up here, and live it up in heaven for all eternity. Uh, no. Okay. Ephesians 2.4 But God, who is rich in mercy for His grace, for His great love, wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. There's no faith mentioned there. Just by grace are you saved. Because that's the truth. God's the one that does the saving. Your faith won't save you. Okay. And hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Remember, your soul is now connected to Jesus Christ, the body. 
Where's Jesus Christ at right now? He's in heaven preparing a place for us. That's where he's at. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. That's what the judgment seat's all about. Getting rewards in heaven. For by grace are ye saved through faith. I've never denied that you have to go through faith to find that grace. But God gives us the steps. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And when God saves you by His grace, God does the saving. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. And that not of yourselves, you don't clean up your life and then get saved. No, true repentance is just you're sorry. For, you have true sorrow in the heart for the state, your sinful, wicked state, the life that you're living. How you sinned against God. what put The sin that put Jesus on the cross. It is the gift of God. Not of works. See, brethren, like, uh, uh, these, brethren, please, brethren, these false uh, wolves in sheep's clothing, false converts, part of the easy believism crowd, will try to switch that around and say, you're saved by your faith through grace. They like to switch that around with their attitude and the life that they live. I'm saved by my faith. You come to them and say, hey, you know that sin that you're doing? Uh, how dare you judge me? I'm saved by my faith. Not God's grace, my faith. How dare you judge me? And they always push you not to judge, yet the Bible says we are to judge. We're to correct one another. We're to hold each everyone to the same standard. The Bible says we're to be of the same mind, of the same judgment. But they've got this big push. What they do? They've turned... Um, faith into works. They've made faith out to be works. Their head belief is a work, and I've earned salvation. Oh, he just doesn't understand. Oh, I do understand. I was a false convert, part of the easy believism crowd. No changed life. Wicked as they come. You look at me, you couldn't tell the difference between me and the lost world. And I look, go into the battle buildings. You couldn't tell me. You can't tell the difference between the people in the battle buildings and the lost world today. They look the same. Because they're full of false converts. Not of works. Stop turning faith into works. Uh, when we read in here about the Jews, they kept trying to bring you under the Levitical laws. Be careful of people like the Roman Catholic Church and the Babel buildings, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, um, all these false relig religions that try to bring you back under works, telling you that you it's something you have to do to be saved. You have to do physical work to earn salvation. Be careful. And that physical work back in Paul's day was, was the Jews trying to bring them back under the Levitical laws. You have to be circumcised and keep the laws of Moses in order to be saved. No, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. After salvation, after God saves us, he changes us. He starts telling us what to do and what not to do. We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. See, there's good works with salvation. Oh, no, 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 it's just faith alone, faith alone. It's garbage to leave people, to, that Satan's using to leave people to hell. It's grace alone. And when we got onto them, so back, a few years back, we got onto them and said, no, it's grace alone. Then they changed their statement from saying faith alone to saying grace alone through faith alone. Well, you can't have both. If it's, if it's alone, then it's just grace. It's God's grace that saves us. God does the saving, period. We can't, nothing that we do can save us. How do we get into a position where God says, okay, I'm going to save you? You go through faith. But it's God's grace that saves, not your faith. Unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. It's before ordained that when you truly get saved and born again, you're going to be a new creature in Christ Jesus, and you're going to do good works according to the Scriptures. You're going to have a new life. But they don't like to read the whole passage and get the context of what's going on here. They just like to read the one part where it says, Through grace... For by grace are you saved through faith. That's it. We're done. Oh, and not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. They just like to read that one verse, and that's it. They don't want to get the context. Context is this. Grace, God's grace is what saves. 
And after God saved you, you're now His workmanship. He created you a new creature in Christ Jesus unto good works. Verse 11, it's guaranteed. There's no good works, you didn't get saved. There's no changed life, you didn't get saved. If your attitude towards absolute truth, the King James Bible, is God's perfect written word, if you still hate the King James Bible, or I'm a King James Bible believer, but when we show you truth in the Word of God, you'll try to explain it away. Oh, Romans 10, that's, that's the Romans road to hell. And no, the, and you don't have a love of the truth, you didn't get saved. You hate the truth, you didn't get saved. You are not a workmanship. His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. God didn't save you. You're still trying to save yourself. You have not submitted and given your life to God fully and completely. You're still holding your life as your own and you're going to believe what you want to believe and you're going to live what you want to live and how you want to live and do what you want to do. That's not the sign of someone who's gotten saved. That's the mark of a false convert. Or in worst, worst case scenarios, a sign of a brother in Christ or sister in Christ that has fallen flat on their face. They're trying to resurrect the old man the Bible talks about. Wherefore, remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision, the Jews, and the flesh made with by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being alien from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. That spiritual circumcision. Our soul is not connected to our body. Our soul is connected to Jesus Christ, His body. Okay? There's a changed life, brothers and sisters of Christ. We're supposed to preach that. It's called full disclosure. You want a new life? You need to repent. You need to believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You need to, you need to confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. Give your life to Christ. And He will give you a new life. And He'll get all that wickedness and that sin out of your life. I don't know what you're talking about. There's no, this isn't wickedness or sin. Okay, my mistake. You're not ready to be saved yet. This isn't, this isn't wickedness. This isn't sin. I'm not that bad. I'm a good person. Oh, my, my, my mistake. You walk away and in your head you're saying, that person ain't ready to be saved yet. We, we need to do full disclosure, brother and sister Christ. It's going to lead to a changed life, a new life, a new creature in Christ Jesus. You're going to belong to God, and God's going to clean up your life. It's full, it's called full disclosure. Okay. Yeah. So, for the first part of this video, because this went on for a while, I wanted to go through the, the plan of salvation again. What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to re react and respond to the lost world? The number one thing we're supposed to be doing, Brother Jesus Christ, is we're supposed to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be preaching the gospel. And some brethren have gotten so burnt out because they've been burned, uh, they've been hurt, um, and they're starting to get burnt out, and there's some preachers out there that are starting to preach it's not worth preaching the gospel that much. We're in the last days, and... It's just, it's just, it's, it's almost like they're trying to motivate you not to preach the gospel. Yes, we are in the last days. Yes, doors are closing, but we are still ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We still need to be preaching the true plan of salvation, as I have preached here today. We need to continue preaching it. Okay? No matter how wicked this world gets, no matter how many doors get slammed in our face, until that last door gets closed, and how do we know when that last door gets closed? We go up. That means it was not loud. We go up. Philip Newton, come up hither. And I go up. That's how we know the last door has been closed. So until that last door gets closed, we need to have the gospel on our hearts, brother and sister Christ, and ready to give a testimony. of how God saved us. And if He could save a wretched man like me, He can save you. That's supposed to be our attitude. And lately it just seems like we don't want to They don't deserve to get saved. They're just so wicked. And, 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 and the, uh, don't forget who you were before you got saved. I thank my Lord and Savior that, that Brother Brian at King James Video Ministries, when he was in a standing position, didn't have that attitude when he led me to Christ. When he led me to the Bible version issue and led me to the absolute truth. 
I was a false convert. I was a wicked, wicked man claiming to be a Christian my whole life. Claiming to be a Christian since I was like 10 or 12. Claiming to be a Christian. If Brian actually looked at me at one point before I got saved, and if he had that attitude of, you're not worth saving, I'm not going to do videos. But it was just, no, just, no. I wouldn't have been able to get saved. I'm talking about not just Brother Brian, but every, if all the brethren had that attitude. How do we get people saved, brothers and sisters of Christ? If Brian didn't do it, would God have, if, since I wanted the truth, would God have brought me to somebody else? Yes, he probably would have. But if all the brethren had that attitude, I think the Lord Brian didn't have that attitude at one time. He does today, but he didn't have that attitude before. Brother and sisters of Christ, we need to get back to having a heartfelt attitude that we want to see people getting saved. Not with our words. Oh, no, no, I want to see people. With our actions. How do we respond to the lost world? You respond by preaching the gospel. And remember the comment section, whether it's under a brother's channel or my channel. When someone's on there and you realize they're lost, you know what I do? I link the gospel message to them. I don't hate them. I don't start calling them names. I don't. So I try not to. <laughs> when I was younger, like a babe in Christ, I got caught up in so many arguments and debates. Uh, but now I've gotten to the point that God has taught me enough and helped me mature enough as a Christian that if you realize you're dealing with a lost person, you can't talk to a lost person about the ways of the Lord in the Bible other than the gospel. You just link the gospel message. They, they're using a Bible version. You link the Bible version issue. If they have a love of the truth, they will watch. They will look at those videos, those Bible version issue videos, and God will bring them to the truth. He did me. If God can save me, He can save them. Brother says, Christ, if God saved you, He can save them. But they've got to want the truth. And I understand that. And we're waiting for open doors sometimes. But you need to try to get the courage to at least preach the gospel once to everybody you know. And if they say, no, I don't want it, we're not, I, I always say this, Brother Christ, we're not car salesmen. Okay, we're not car salesmen. I wanted my daughter to be saved. Brothers and sisters of Christ, I wanted my daughter to be saved. But I'm not a car salesman. I live a li life of Christ, and that pushed her away. My ex-wife, I live a life of Christ, it pushed her away. There's a lot of sacrifices on the altar of sacrifice laid, that old hymn, is you're all on the altar of sacrifice laid. Spiritual sacrifices. I have lost so much standing for the Word of God and living for the Word of God. My heart's desire is that my ex-wife gets saved. I still pray for her to this day. I pray, I was always praying for my daughter. Now, my daughter's in God's hands. My heartfelt desire, brothers Christ, is to see people get saved. And it seems, and this is just natural, brothers of Christ, it seems to be more heartfelt towards somebody you know and care about versus some stranger. But we need to have the same attitude towards everybody when it comes to our love for them, which is and preaching the gospel, preaching truth to them. Okay, we're supposed to help the lost world out anytime we can, and if it be possible, live peaceably with the lost world. But we need to be preaching the gospel. We're not a car salesman. Back to what I was saying. We're not a car salesman. If they reject Jesus Christ, they reject Jesus Christ. And at that point, you're waiting for them to reach that broken point where a door will open that you can go back to witnessing to them. And that's what I pray for. I, say, I always pray that, Lord, give them every opportunity. To get saved. And what I mean by opportunity, brothers of Christ, Lord, bring them to their knees a million times in their life. And if it takes a million times for them to finally get saved and born again, please, Lord, give them every opportunity. And I know our God. Our God is a, is a loving God. He's a gracious God. He's a righteous God. Okay? He, he's slow to anger. But Lord, that slow to anger, Lord, please let that slow to anger mean that you're giving them every opportunity before it's time to send them to hell. Brothers of Christ, that needs to be our attitude. And we're starting to become prideful. We're starting to become arrogant. Uh, we've become cowards. I'm pointing at this guy right here. For the longest time, I, was, I'm not, I wasn't good with words. And 
I've been so used to being alone and hiding behind my video games and everything as a lost man. I, I, I went from being, when I was younger, being very social and having all these friends and talking to everybody to being this really quiet man that just kept to himself. It, it took a lot for God to open me up and give me courage to, to go out and speak to people. It's not always easy, brothers and sisters in Christ. But we need to overcome that stuff. We need to stop being prideful. We need to stop being arrogant. We need to stop, you know, being cowards. And we need to get out there and preach the word of eternal life. We need to preach Jesus Christ to them. The true plan of salvation. Right. This is part one. I really wanted to, this. I wasn't going to do this. I was going to go straight into the meat of the, the study. But I really wanted to go over the gospel again with the brethren to remind you guys why you got saved. It seems like some of us are forgetting why we got saved, and we're starting to go the way of the world. We're supposed to be a living testimony. Just the life you live will testify of Jesus Christ. We're still supposed to use our words. Because some people say, well, if, if my life is a testimony, then I don't really have to say anything to anybody. No, you still do, brothers and sisters Christ. As much as, like, when I was being a coward, I wanted to do that. Just live a life of Christ and keep to myself, and, and, and then maybe that will lead some people to Christ. We still need to be speaking to them. We still need to be witnessing with our lips. But your life is also supposed to be a witness. There's people who are going to look at you and go, How? when this house, I'll give you an example, this house... Was, a, a, the, a, was going to be burned down. There was a huge fire that was four miles away, and it went four miles in one day. And we got a warning that since it went four miles in one day, a forest fire, that this house could be burned up in a day. And I packed up a few things, and I, I, I drove to Gold Beach. There was a place to set there that had, um, I forgot the name of the place, uh, you know, an organization that helps with uh, disasters and stuff like that. And I'm sitting there, and I'm doing Bible studies. I'm reading. I got my Bible highlighted, and I'm watching some Bible studies. And Pete, there's one walks up to me and goes, "You must be a pastor." And I stopped to think about this. This is this is this is the fruit of these Babel buildings in easy believism. Okay, um, if I watch Bible studies and I do Bible studies and highlight my Bible, I must be a pastor. Why isn't every Bible believing, God fearing men and women doing that? I'm talking about the easy believers and false convert Christianity. Why isn't everybody doing that? Because they're not taught to do that. They're taught that's only something the pastor does. Okay? But the point is, I'm sitting there talking to some of them, and they look at me and go, how can you be so calm and so peaceful? You could lose your home. You could lose everything. I'm like, well, God's the one who's in charge. God's, oh, yeah, 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 I know God's in charge. No, you don't, because they were all scared to death. They were going to lose their homes. They were going to lose everything. They were scared to death. And I'm sitting there, and they look at me and say, and I, try, I hope that I was able to witness to some people there, because they look at you and go, you have something I want. That's what it has to do with the life, living the life of Christ. You have something I want. That's what the lost world is going to do if you're living the life of Christ. You've got peace. You've got joy. Not fun. Remember, fun is flesh. All fun is is elevating the flesh and letting the flesh be in charge. You know, adrenaline rushes, video games, uh, overeating, you know, fun, fun, fun. You know, I used to do a lot of things when I was a kid that we call fun. Swinging out on ropes over high uh, gorges, they call them gorges, rivers, but they do pockets of like mini lakes. And there's these huge rocks that you can run and jump off of a 20-foot rock into the water. Woohoo! Adrenaline rush. That's fun. Fun is flesh. Okay. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about they saw peace in me and they saw joy in me. I was singing hymns. I was helping people out. I was trying to lead people to Christ. That's what it means to be a living testimony for Jesus Christ. You can't be losing your temper, brothers and sisters in Christ. That's going into the next part, the next part of the study. You can't be losing your temper. You can't start setting a bad example. You can't get mad at them. If they reject Jesus Christ... You're still supposed to have peace and joy and say, Okay, Lord, praise you, O Lord, to give, for giving me the courage to witness to them. And I pray, Lord, that you give them every opportunity to get saved. I planted a seed. Uh, someone else will come along and water. Lord, I've served you and I'm doing what you've asked me to do. Even if they spit in your face, even if they keyed your car, it doesn't matter. Praise the Lord. And that brings us into the next part of the study. So... 
I'm going to go ahead and end the video here with grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus. Let's head over to part two.